Good morning to each and every one of you and welcome once again to another worship experience from the Abyssinia Baptist Church. We're so excited and delighted that you have tuned in with us on this morning and we bless God for this day that he has given to us that we might rejoice and be glad in it. We thank God for his presence with us on this day. This is the first Sunday in the month of August, and we certainly want to take this opportunity, lest we forget, and certainly celebrate with all those who are celebrating their special days, their birthdays or anniversaries during the month of August. We know that on this coming Wednesday, First Lady will be celebrating her birthday, so we ask that you would continue to lift her in prayer and even to send her a shout out and wish her well on her particular day. But to all of those who are celebrating in this month, we bless the Lord and we thank the Lord for each and every one of you. We also want to take this opportunity and certainly send out our prayers. There are so many that we uh, are duty bound to pray for by our church family, but we want to take particular mentioning today and we want to lift the name of Brother Alfonso Gann, our faithful trustee. We want to certainly pray for him uh, and his wife, along with Brother Gerald Lee, uh, who we knew had been under the weather, and Deacon Ralph Calhoun. We also solicit prayers for those and all of the family of Abyssinia Baptist. So we thank God for them, and let us continue to pray that God would strengthen them uh, uh, that they might continue to do the work that they, they have been called to do. So we thank God for this day. We're going to move uh, rapidly along on this morning. Uh, we're going to ask that you return with us in your Bibles uh, to the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel, the sixth chapter, where we shall read in your hearing verses 1 through 12. We're going to be focusing in on the entirety of this particular section of scripture. So we ask that you would find 2 Samuel chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. And there you will find these words written. Again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubim. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadad that was in Gibeah. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. And when they came to the nation threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error. And there he died by the ark of God. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. And he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How shall the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David. But David carried it aside to the house of Obed-Eden the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. 
And it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertaineth unto him, because the ark of God. So David went and brought the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. Let us pray. Eternally everlasting Father, we thank you once again for this glorious Sunday morning. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be able to share your word as we reveal what you shall hear, what we shall hear from you today through the Spirit. We pray, O oh Lord, your blessings upon the hearers, but also, also importantly, we ask that you would empower the doers. We crown this an awesome privilege and honor, Lord, that we might be able to put our feet beneath your table and receive what thus saith the Lord. Thank you for our blessings, O Lord. This we do ask and pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. All right, all right. Bless the Lord. We thank God for each and every one of you. We do want to remind you just before we get started that uh, immediately following our sermon today, we will be uh, celebrating the Lord's Supper. Uh, so you may put me on pause at this moment if you need to to prepare your supplements uh, that we might be able to commune together uh, at the Lord's Supper at the conclusion of today's message. So we thank you, each and every one of you, again and always. When you follow David's life, it almost reads as one of those rags to riches stories one that people will view and declare that would never happen to them. But I don't think it is as far-fetched as some of us would believe. For there are plenty of human stories that began in the most undesirable of conditions, and they survived some significant challenges and made it to where they could look back over their journey and confess just how blessed they have been. Sometimes we like to call them privilege or special or some other classification, but I tend to believe that they were, they were fortunate enough to recognize their God-given abilities and follow the path that God had laid out before them. And what happens many times with us is that we see where people have arrived at. We see their successes or their accomplishments, but what we fail to see is the journey that it took to get them there. For most of you would discover that the path wasn't always smooth, nor the day was always filled with sunshine. But those are the unpleasantries that come along with the achievements that have been made. And right now I'm reading the memoirs of Brother John Lewis, the recent congressman who we just buried on this past week, and I think upon what I've learned about the life of Barack Obama and uh, uh, Oprah Winfrey and others that appear to wear the crown of success. And there are many successful lives, and they didn't have to reach the heights of those that I've mentioned in order to be successful. I believe that success is achieving what God intended and purposed for your life. Let me say that again. Success is achieving what God intended and purposed for your life. In reading this story of David or the, even the events from his life or someone else's, the blessing is in what you are able to pick up and glean from their journey to help you make your journey to being the best you that you can be. 
And to do such is to dismiss the, the fairy tale and really paint the reality that one's success is not measured by dollars and cents. But truly one's success is measured by doing you in such a way that brings glory to God. So let me stop and tell you, comparing your success with someone else's is a no-no. Just see what you can learn from their story to help you build and write your story. And that is what we shall do today <clears throat> for just a few moments as we look at this event in David's life. And let me begin by, by asking you, how many of you have ever gotten upset with God? Tell the truth and Shame to death. Well, you'll be happy to know that you're not alone. Many Christians have harbored at one time or another some degree of resentment towards the Lord for something that was either allowed or not prevented from happening in their lives. And this is generally followed by the inquiry of why me? And the response that is oftentimes given and follows is the result in freezing our relationship with God as though we are punishing him or getting back at him for what has transpired in our lives. And I sit back and I, I imagine sometimes that God sitting there on the throne gets a good laugh at our futile efforts of expressing our anger towards him. For when God doesn't act according to our desires, then anger or an attitude stirs within us. And our retaliation, most cases, is to separate ourselves from either the work, the worship, or the witness of which God has called us to carry out in the name of the Lord. And some may even exercise their separation from all three. But my brothers and sisters, children of the almighty God, when we would do such a thing as that, my mother used to have a way of asking the question. She would say, who are you hurting? And someone most likely should have asked David that very question as his anger against the Lord kindled, be prompted to him to abandon the ark of God in the yard of Obed-Eden. Today, David would look back on that moment and if he could speak to us, he would tell us, don't let your attitude forfeit your blessing. And now, if there was one person in the Old Testament who you would have not suspected to develop an attitude towards God, it would have been David. I mean, this is the young man who wore the internal tattoo which read man after God's own heart. And from the time he was extracted from his father's field attending sheep, one could notice the favor of God resting on Brother David, examining his response to such a favor. David reciprocated from the favor that he received from the Almighty God with his faithfulness. When he stood before Goliath, he was being faithful 
unto God. Offering his body as a living sacrifice. And then avoiding the killer instinct of King Saul while still remaining loyal to him because he recognized him as the Lord's anointed, David was being faithful. And David demonstrated his faithfulness unto God, right down to his most recent victory over the Philistines in the valley of Rephaim, just a few verses over before where we began reading. But David knew, my brothers and sisters, his success was the hand of God. And God had been faithful unto David. And David determined to be faithful unto God. And I believe that that is the hope and the expectancy of every earnest believer as they began their relationship with the Almighty God. I believe that we enter into it with all good intentions and desires to be faithful. However, as we continue to glean from this journey of David and his journey of his faithfulness, we find that it did not exempt him from also being foolish. As we read this particular event in his life, I was able to note several things that David did that were foolish in this particular chapter of his life. We look at the scripture, we will find the first foolish thing that David did was he placed the Ark of God or the Ark of the Covenant on a cart. Not taking into account that God had instructed Moses that the ark was to be carried by the Levites using poles. And when we look at this particular event and analyze it, the two men that David allowed to carry out this function, one, were not Levites. And two, the cart was not poles. So that was one of the foolish things that David did. The second foolish thing David did was he got angry with God. And my brothers and sisters, that's like getting angry with an officer for writing you a speeding ticket for doing 80 miles per hour in a 50 mile per hour zone. And regardless of your reasoning that you might try to offer, you must understand that the law is the law. And God, like the officer, has every right to enforce the law. But David got angry from what God had done. And the third foolish thing that I note in this event in David's life was that he abandoned the ark at the home of Obed-Eden because of his anger. Brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you today that as we grow in our relationship with God, we can learn from David that we too are subject to do some foolish things. And it may not be intentional, it may not be deliberate, but they're foolish just the same. It's like pushing aside our passion for God or for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ or righteousness for our own personal pleasures. That, my brothers and sisters, is being foolish. And what did the spinner say? Everybody plays the fool sometime. 
But the Bible paints a picture here that David copped an attitude with God because of God's punishment of Uzzah. And I've thought, I said, David, you need to revisit Numbers 4 and verse 15. Because there you will find it says by the word of God that only the Kohathites, who are part of the Levites, are to carry the Ark of the Covenant and they must not touch it lest they die. So David, you would notice right then and there that that's the law. And the law is the law. But I always know that God is a merciful God, and so there I'm inclined to believe that there may have even been something else in others' judgment that we have not learned from this text. But nonetheless, the law is the law. And God's judgment upon Uzzah created a fear in David. And now the exact reason for David's fear is it, not mentioned. Maybe after seeing what happened to Uzzah, David feared that he was next in line, being an accomplice to the act that has taken place. Maybe David feared that the ark was now cursed and he didn't want to bring the curse of God into the holy city. We don't know what it was that David feared, but whatever it was, it teaches us that fear can keep us from following through with things that we had been led or called to do. And I believe that this is just as relative in carnal living as it is in our Christian journey. When things don't flow as we desire, we find that somewhere the music stops. And the joy fades and one's willingness to move forward begins to diminish. I read where someone said that the human reaction to fear is number one, they fight. Number two, they take flight. And number three, they flee, freeze. Well, when we look at this particular event in David's life, David certainly couldn't fight against God. His arms were too short to box with God. And then number two, there is nowhere in which he could run because David said <coughs> later, if I make my bed in hell, thou art there. If I fly to the uttermost ends of the earth, thou art there. So there was no place that David could run from God. So his human reflex was to freeze. And he stopped what he was intending to do in his tracks. But another quick lesson that David's response teaches us here is that fear contradicts faith. And so I want to advise you and admonish you today to let your faith be greater than your fears. Yes, sometimes mistakes are made. And even there are times when the most devoted believer will mess up. Things will not and do not always go according to our plan, and we may be chastised by the Lord for doing it. But still, I admonish you today, don't let your anger or fear rob you of God's favor. David, out of anger and fear in the story generated by the foolishness of his actions, left the Ark of the Covenant at the house of Obed-Edom until he learned, <coughs> Scripture says 90 days later, that Obed-Edom, his house and all that he had was being blessed. So I want you to take notice of that, my brothers and sisters, today. While David was rebelling, Obed-Edom was rejoicing. While David was sulking, Obed-Edom 
was smiling. While David was pining, Obed-Edom was prospering. I'm here to let you know today that we'll never know what blessings were missed out on because of David's stubborn actions. But whatever they were, they had been forfeited until David had a change of attitude. And whatever he feared, he soon found out it was not worth what he was missing. So the Bible tells us that David gathered his men and he went back to Obed Eden's house and he ushered the ark of the covenant into the city of David with the same rejoicing that he started out with. And my brothers and sisters, the beauty in this story is that no matter how David reacted and no matter how David responded, when David did the right thing, God proved himself again to be a forgiving God. And God, as the record says, God blessed David. God blessed David's family. God blessed David's kingdom. God blessed David's name. And I tell you that we can glean from Brother David from this treasured lesson not to let our attitudes forfeit our blessings. I'm here to tell you today, we can't even imagine the blessings we're forfeiting when the presence of God is absent from our lives. The very God who knows what we need and knows when we need it and is able to provide it even before we ask it. Don't push him out of your life. Don't let attitudes, emotions, or fear cause you to forfeit the blessings that he has in store for you. And I truly believe, my brothers and sisters, we might say it sometimes as a cliche, but I truly believe that the Lord is still in the blessing business. And there's a blessing that's in store just for you. But you got to make sure that you are faithful unto God. Yes, you will do some things foolishly. But understand, God is a forgiving God. And even in your foolishness, God will bless you when you come back around and you do what is right. These are some of the trinkets that we can glean from this event in David's life. And I'm here to let you know David is no more special unto God than you are. And God is no respecter of person. If you believe in God, you can have the blessings that God has in store for your life. And it doesn't matter how far you've had to come. It doesn't matter what your past may have been. We can celebrate today. Thanks be to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who opened the path that we might be able to walk along this journey of life and receive the favors of God and using what abilities he's given us to bring him glory. And if we would do that, our lives would be marked a success. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, we come before you once again and we thank you for what we have heard and what our souls have received. We thank you, O oh God, for your forgiveness and we ask, oh God, right now that if there is any sin among us, that you would purge us, strengthen us, and help us to be better. That we might begin to move forward from this day, doing those things that are most pleasing in your sight. 
We thank you today, O oh God, because even as we are here in this particular moment, we must acknowledge that favor has fallen upon us. But Lord, we ask that you would help us to be faithful unto you. Help us, O oh God, to dispense fear that we might continue to move forward in what you have our lives to do. Lord, we pray today that if there's anybody who today who does not know you for the pardoning of their sins, that they will open up their hearts and let you come in. Lord, we ask your blessings upon the hearers, the receivers, and the doers of your word. Thank you for David's journey that helps us to write the story for our journey. This we do ask and pray in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our souls say, Amen. Amen, my brothers and sisters. It is because of what Christ has done on Calvary's cross that enables us to reap the blessings that the Lord has in store for our lives. And so at this moment, we ask that you would gather your a communion supplies that we might be able to go to the table of brotherhood together. Let us pray. Father, for what we are about to receive again, we are grateful and thankful. We count it a blessing, O oh Lord, to be your child and to be called into your kingdom and given the purposes that you have given our lives. We thank you right now for the bloodshed of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We thank you for his suffering. We thank you for his example, O oh God, because like David, even through Jesus, you show to us your faithfulness. And as you were faithful unto them, O oh God, we know that you will be faithful unto us. So we pray today, O oh God, as we come to the table of brotherhood, that you would bless our homes, bless the supplements that we're about to receive in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. <coughs> The Bible says that on that particular night that our Lord and Savior was crucified, that he sat there with his disciples and it says that after the dinner, he took the bread and he broke it. And he began to distribute it amongst them, telling them, take ye eat, for this is my body that is broken for you. And my brothers and sisters, when I think about what our Savior had to go through. Just for my sake, I cringe, but I also thank him because he did it that we would not have to. He was broken that we could be made whole. So he took the body and after blessing it, he distributed it among them. And he says, take ye, eat. Let us eat together. And in the very same manner, he took the cup. And he said unto them as he held it up, that this is representing my blood. This is the cup of the new covenant that I make with you. And my brothers, he says, as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you do show forth my death, burial, and resurrection until I come again. And my beloved sisters, he did this just for us, that our sins might be washed away. The songwriter says, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And so we remember his shed blood for our sake. And they took the cup and they drank from it. 
and our souls say, Amen. Now the Apostle Paul had written that every man should examine himself before he eats of the bread or drinks of the cup. But my brothers and sisters, even as you look at yourself, you'll see your mistakes, you'll recognize your faults, and even be able to identify your failures. But I'm here to let you know on behalf of the Almighty God, He is able to redeem you from no matter where you are. Give your life to Him that He might make its fruitfulness a part of his kingdom. I encourage you, as always, to visit us on our website at Abyssinia Baptist Church, www.abyssiniabaptistchurch.org. And there you may, if you're able to uh, leave your offerings or tithe, give your tithes into the Abyssinia family, I specifically address you to ask you to continue to support our ministry, support our church in the paying of your tithes and the giving of your offerings because this is what allows us to keep going on even in this season in which we are in. I'm here to let you know that if we are faithful in this time, we will not be able to describe the blessings that the Lord will send our way as he brings us through. So we encourage you to please be faithful to God just as you would if we were in his house. So we encourage you to do what you can do in these critical times. And until we are able to meet and come together again, we bid you God's blessings and we pray that his favor will overflow into your life. And so until I see you again, as always, I ask you to stay tuned, stay safe, stay tuned, and stay connected. At Abyssinia, we would always close our service in this way. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. Until we meet again. God be with you.